Hello there and welcome. I'm Bob Proctor. You've probably seen me in The Secret. Well, we're going to expand on the message from The Secret. We're going to go beyond that. Do you know, in The Secret, we talked about the law of attraction. There's been two, three hundred million people impacted with that message. But I want to take you a little further. There's 11 lost laws. These 11 laws, they go along with the law of attraction, I think you're going to find rather interesting. And I want to share a few thoughts with you that lead up to this. And I want you to prepare for these lessons as they come out. Do you know, the author said that we should proceed to use our thinking faculty and take care that it does not use you. Well, I think that's true. Do you know, most people are controlled by what's going on outside. They're not using their mental faculties to really control their life. The author says, master your mind and guide it intelligently. Well, you know, if you look at the, um, the results of most people, that's not happening. People are not mastering their mind. They're not using it. They're not controlling their own life. As you get involved in these laws, each one of them brings a specific message. And as you bring your mind in harmony with these laws, your whole life is going to change. Let me continue here. He said, learn to think as you ought to think. Give your mental life to the matters that are absolutely essential to your welfare. Have you ever wondered why 1% of our population earns 96% of all the money that's being earned? Do you know, things are so totally out of balance that when you hear those statistics for the first time, you think they can't possibly be true, but they are. And you know, Huxley was right. He said there's only one corner of the universe that we can change, and that's our own self. Now, this author said, the balance of all thought to themes of beauty, truth, and progress. In other words, live with the ideal, but do not neglect the practical. He said, aim to adjust the two and strive to be on the outside of what you idealize on the inside. Your thoughts make you, and your ideals, principles, or ruling desires will determine your destiny. Now, I have studied this material since 1961. October 1961 is when I really began to study this. So naturally, I've watched a lot of things change. I've watched things change in the world. I've watched the attitude of people shift and it shifts primarily because we're starting to understand ourselves better. We have here learned to use your powers unless you wish to be used by them. Make a daily effort to use the knowledge that you have gained. Try to improve upon all of your opinions. Endeavor to obtain a truer and a larger conception of each of your personal views. Now, I have found as we start to understand this, and as we start to dig into these laws, that everything in our life starts to shift. Do you know what the laws are? Think about it for a moment. Did you really understand the law of attraction before you saw the secret? Do you know, a lot of people saw the secret and they thought that the law of attraction just came into being. That's like hearing about the law of gravity and think we just invented it yesterday. The law of attraction has always been here. It's based on another great law, the law of vibration. Well, you're going to find, as we get into these seven laws, I'm going to give you a short overview on each one of them. And if you take the videos that you're going to get, and then take each one of them and watch one every day for a week. Now, it may take you a few weeks to go through this, but let's face it, you've gone all your life without understanding, and another few weeks to dedicated to understanding it is going to make a huge difference. This is a phenomenal program that you're a part of. I am so pleased that I have the opportunity to dig into these laws in some depth and share them with you. You know, the, the author points out that man's problems are mental in nature. They have no existence outside of themselves. And it has been discovered that nearly all will yield up their solutions when subjected to a broad and exact analysis. You can acquire the ability by studying the law of life. Do you know I mentioned on The Secret where Dr. Warner Von Braun said that the natural laws of this universe are so precise that we don't have any difficulty sending people to the moon and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. Now, isn't it strange that you would go all through life and never really understand these laws? And yet these laws are impacting every aspect of your life. 
from your relationships to the health of your body, to your business, to your personal skills. Everything is based on law. When we violate the law, we lose. When we live in harmony with the law, we start to win. Now he said you can acquire the ability by studying the law of life and the modes of expression. Then by constant effort, use your thinking faculty in constructive ways as you work with these laws. Now have a good and sound reason for all the views you hold. Isn't that an interesting concept? Think of that for a moment. You'll hear people say, well, I believe that. In fact, you hear yourself saying it. Why do you believe it? Have you ever really analyzed your own belief patterns? Why do you believe these things? As you try to find why you hold these views, many of your old-time views are going to fall to pieces. Form a clear and definite idea regarding your convictions as to why as you do as you do, and to why as you think as you think. You see, most people never really ask themselves, why do I believe that? Do you know almost all your beliefs you've inherited? Well, that's true. Dates way back into your genetic nature. From the moment of conception, your ancestors are built right into the genes. And we've got a lot of ideas locked up in our mind that violate the laws of this universe, and that's what's causing our problem. See, it's no accident that a very small select group of people live really meaningful lives, and so many others are struggling all the way through their life. Well, you're going to find, as you get involved in this program, and I would encourage you to really take this serious. This is serious work. It's helped me earn millions of dollars, build a company that operates all over the world, make really meaningful friends on every continent. If it's done that for me, what can it do for you? Now, keep in mind, when I started to study this, I only had about two months high school. I had no business experience, and my whole life changed like that. There's so much good stuff here. This author says, clear and exact thinking is a very great necessity. It is, in fact, a sure means to advancement on the mental as well as the spiritual plane. Now, I'm going to leave you with something here that I think is very important. A line of distinction, however, should be drawn between mere surface thought, that is, ordinary, trivial, and commonplace thinking, and real thought which is associated with the understanding of these laws, with the understanding of truth. The latter is deep thinking, which arouses dormant powers, quickens the perception, and leads to the enlargement of life on all planes. You see, most people's thinking takes them to last night's ball game, maybe the weather, or who won the election. What we're talking about is deep, penetrating thought. Really dig into our mind. Let's figure out how we can take quantum leaps, just jumps ahead, rather than small incremental changes. Let's find out how we can turn our annual income to a monthly income like that, because you can do it. If I do it, you can do it. And I'm going to show you how I did it. And I'm going to take you into each one of the other 11 laws. And I will, in fact, elaborate on the law of attraction, because when you really understand that law, everything in your life is going to start to shift. See, the truth, the real basic truth, is everything that comes into our life, we've attracted. We're literally magnetized to it. Do you know that your brain is an electronic switching station? It controls the vibratory rate of this massive energy that we call our body. I'm not my body. I'm not my brain. You're not your body. You're not your brain. But you do have a brain. We have a marvelous mind. And we can control the vibration we're in. And when we do, we start to control what comes into our life. You're going to love these laws, and you're going to want to share them, and you should share them. Givers gain. I want you to get them. I want you to study them. Get involved in this program, and then set the side of time to really study it. Don't treat this as just any recorded program. This is very special. Since October 1961, I have been absolutely obsessed with studying one subject why you do what you do, and why you don't do many of the things you want to do. I want you to think of what you really want to do. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? Do you know if you go to my website, I tell you I'm there. If you tell me what you want, I can show you how to get it. And I can. But you've got to decide what you want. And then 
you want to get into these lessons. 11 laws. It's phenomenal. And the 12th, I'm going to elaborate on it for you. Make sure you get involved. Set aside the time, and you're going to love it. The videos that you're going to receive here will change your life. Along with the rest of the program, life will never be the same again. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you. And I look forward to meeting you in a seminar sometime in the very near future. Mind is the master power that molds and makes. And man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. We think in secret and it comes to pass. Our environment is but our looking glass. Do you know James Allen wrote those words a little over a hundred years ago. I began to study them close to 50 years ago. Every year they mean a little more to me. I want to talk to you here about the law of thinking. Thinking is a powerful force. It's been said that it's the most powerful force we're capable of. Do you know Archibald McLeish, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, had a character stand up in a play one time called The Secret of Freedom, and the character says, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you'll find in a pig or a horse. Do you know it sounds like a funny line, but it's true. Everything else you will find in a pig or a horse. Do you see, the mind, it's the most powerful force in the world. And thinking is a very, very powerful form of energy. Thought waves are cosmic waves that penetrate all time and space. Now, as we go into the laws of thinking, I want to refer to a few points from Raymond Hollowell. He said, to the average person, life is an enigma, a deep mystery, a complex and incomprehensible problem, or appears so. But it's very simple if one holds the key. You see, mystery is just another name for ignorance. All things are mysterious when they're not understood. But when we understand life, it no longer appears mysterious. Do you know, until I was 26, life was a real mystery to me. It was an incomprehensible problem. And, of course, I had many problems. But then I began to study, and I began to study this information. And, you know, it took me a while, but as I started to adopt the concepts and adapt my mind to them, my life started to change. My problems started to sort of disappear. I started to earn a lot more money. I was living in a healthy body, very rarely ever being ill. I noticed that I started to attract different people into my life, more interesting people. You see, the truth was, I was just becoming a more interesting person. A person's interesting because they're interested. And you see, as we start thinking powerful thoughts, everything starts to happen. Now let me share something that Raymond Hollywell said. He said, we're progressive beings, you and I. A creature of constant growth before whom lies an illimitable ocean of progress to be navigated and conquered only by development and culture of our inherent powers. The progress of the individual is largely determined by what? What do you think it is? Now, let me share that again. The progress of the individual is largely determined by... It's a good question, isn't it? It's by his ruling mental state. Because the mind is the basic factor in governing power in the entire life. My life and your life, you see. Attention should be given to the predominant mental state, for it will regulate the action and direction of all one's forces, faculties, and powers, the sum total of which will inevitably determine many particular experiences, and the personal fate. You see, the ruling state 
is like the CPU. You're familiar with your computer. Well, that's, that's what the ruling state of the computer is. You see? The ruling state of mind is made up of various mental attitudes, um, which the individual adopts towards things, events, and life in general. If the attitudes are broad in mind, optimistic in tone, and true of life, his predominant mental state will be correspond and exhibit a highly constructive and progressive tendency. As almost all the forces of the personality function through the conscious mind in one way or another, and as the daily mental and physical acts are largely controlled by the conscious mind, it's obvious that the leading mental state must determine the direction which the powers of the individual must proceed. You see, the ruling mental state is everything. I know that you and I have been trained to believe that we've got to change what's going on out there. You know, we've got to fix this and fix that. And we have literally been programmed to live through our senses, to go by what we hear, see, smell, taste, or touch. But you know, there's been little thought given to our higher faculties, perception, the will, intuition, memory, reason, imagination. And see, they're all our inner faculties, and that's where it really happens. This is where it all begins, inside. You don't have to worry about changing what's going on out there. I don't care if it's your bank account or the health of your body. You're going to find the x-rays will show a different you. The bank account will show a different balance. And everything in life will begin to change as you take over the power of thought. Thought is a very, very powerful force. Let me share something that Raymond Hollywell says on thought. He says, thought is a subtle element. Although it is invisible to the physical sight, it is an actual force of substance, as real as electricity, light, heat, water, or even stone. We are surrounded by a vast ocean of thought through which our thoughts pass like currents of electricity, or tiny streaks of light or musical waves. You can flash your thoughts from pole to pole, completely around the world, many times, in less than a single second. Now think of what he's saying. You can flash your thoughts right around the globe several times in less than a single second. Scientists tell us that thought is compared with the speed of light. They tell us our thoughts travel at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. We have a hard time comprehending that. He goes on to point out that our thought travels 930,000 times faster than the sound of our voice. No other force or power in the universe yet known is as great or as quick. It is a proven fact scientifically that the mind is a battery force, the greatest of any known element. You see, the thinker is like the computer processor. You know, when it's finely tuned, it really works fast. You can think. And what you think ultimately produces the results in your life. See, there's laws to thought. I'm going to tell you something that I've learned beyond a shadow of a doubt. The thoughts that you think and turn over to your emotional mind instantly, by law, control the vibratory rate of your body. Your body is a mass of magnetic energy. It truly is. You know, if you put your body in front of an infrared television camera in a completely dark room, you just see it as a glistening, radiating, gleaming form. As a matter of fact, if you could hear it, it would be like a symphonic concert being played. Oh, I know, to the eye, it just looks like a thing, you know. But it's not a thing. The body itself is one of the most magnificent instruments on the planet, and you live in one. And it's how you think that is going to dictate what this body is going to do. We know that our actions produce our results. If we want to change our results, we've got to change our actions. However, 
If you don't go to the thought, the actions are never, oh, the actions may change temporarily. But believe me, the thoughts that you think repeatedly become fixed in your subconscious mind. And those thoughts are going to determine what happens in your life. Make no mistake about it. Now, play with this for a moment. We hear a lot about positive and negative attitudes or positive and negative thinking. Well, some think that we deal with two forces. That is, we attract the good and we must do away with the bad. You've heard that many times. We attract the good, we must do away with the bad. Well, that is not true. For example, if we are cold, we do not work with cold and heat alike in order to get warm. This is very simple processing that we're going through here, mental processing. We build a fire, and we gather around the fire, and we enjoy the heat that is extended from it, and we become warm. As we build warmth, the cold disappears, for the cold is the absence of the heat. Just like dark is absence of the light. Let there be light, you see. To be warm, we give our whole thought to those things which tend to create warmth. We ignore the cold in thinking of heat and bring forth heat. Prosperity and poverty are not two things. They are merely two sides of one thing, the same thing. There is but one power, rightly or wrongly used. We cannot think of plenty and then worry about the unfavorable conditions that may seem apparent. If you want to change the results in your life, and I'm just working on the premise that you do, or you wouldn't need me watching this film right now, give your thought to your mind. Give serious thought to this series of overviews that I'm doing on the laws that you're studying. You see, Huxley was right. He said the only corner of the universe that we can be certain of improving, it's our own self. That's all. You know all those things we want to change outside? They're all a reflection of what's going on inside. Well, that may be a big idea for you right now, but as you study this for a week, a month, a year, and then come back and hear me say that, it's going to sound like a totally different statement. You, Choose your thoughts, and your thoughts create your life. You truly do become what you think about. There is a law of thinking. Make no mistake about it. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you. Hello there. How would your life change if you woke up this morning and find that someone had deposited $9 million dollars in your bank account. How would that affect you? How would your mind shift if next week, just like that, you attracted a thousand new clients into your business? A thousand. What would your life be like if, bang, just like that, you realized you had the energy of a 20-year-old? How would your mind shift if Mensa recognized you as the smartest person on the planet? They're good questions, aren't they? Well, let me tell you something. There's a lot more than nine million just waiting there to come into your life. There's an infinite supply. And the thousand clients, there's tens of thousands of people out there just waiting for someone to come and serve them. And the 20-year-old energy, do you know all the energy there ever was or ever will be is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. No one gets energy. Everyone releases energy. And desire is the triggering mechanism that releases energy. And as far as being the smartest, hey, listen, the smartest sometimes are not the most effective. Being smart isn't the answer. Being effective is the answer. 
Did you know that all the knowledge there ever was or ever will be is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time? I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you about the law of supply as we're going through and giving you an overview in this video series of the laws, those 11 lost laws. Supply is one of them. Do you know, Hollywell said that man's never satisfied, never satisfied. The fact is deplored by many, but God did not intend man to be forever satisfied. You see, dissatisfaction is actually a creative state. That's right. There's a lot of people that mix up satisfaction and happiness. You can be very happy and very dissatisfied. I am never satisfied with the results that we get in our company, any of the companies that we have. I'm happy with them, but never satisfied. See, dissatisfaction is a creative state. Yeah, it was dissatisfaction that led to the the incandescent light. Edison just got sick and tired of dealing with a wax candle or a kerosene lamp. You see? Yeah, it was dissatisfaction that led the Wright brothers to introduce us to a brand new kingdom. Yeah, it was dissatisfaction that took Edby Hillary right to the top of the world. It was dissatisfaction that caused John Kennedy to make a statement that we would be on the moon in this decade. He said that way back in the 60s. Now, I hope you are dissatisfied. And if you're not, well, I'm going to say a quiet prayer for you. See, we believe, therefore, that it is right and good for people to seek to gratify all pure desires and ambitions. Now, I know there's a lot of people that don't agree with that, but they don't agree with a lot of things. But you're going to find out the small select group of people that really understand these laws, understand there is an infinite source of supply. Everything comes from one infinite source. Everything's made from the same. The difficulty with some is that they can more easily look to the creature as the source of their substance than to the creator. Just beyond the average person's grasp. We don't really believe that God is the source of our substance. Now, when we start to believe it, I think it starts to happen. Let me share something with you that I read a long time ago. Dr. Werner von Braun was one of the greatest scientists that ever lived. He's considered by many as the father of the space program. Think about this for a moment. He said, after studying this spectacular... Now, before I mention this, let me also mention that for a long time, science and religion were antagonistic. They just could not come together but they since have come together. Now, von Braun said that after years of studying the spectacular mysteries of the cosmos, he was led into a firm belief in the existence of God. Now, I'm not trying to turn this into a religious dissertation. I am just mentioning my own personal belief after studying these laws for very close to 50 years. I see the law as the uniform and orderly method of the omnipotent God. A law is something that happens every time with every person everywhere. And everyone that has accomplished anything will be quick to tell you this. See, as we look back, everybody loves a dead genius. They really do. But you know, all of these great geniuses from history that we look at, they were considered geniuses when they were alive. The Wright brothers were considered real heretics. They really were. See, the people that made it happen, they were out of the box. They weren't ordinary thinkers. But they understood that there was this governing process called the law. You see, before we're able to believe in abundance of good, we've got to then see and enjoy uh, that everything comes from one infinite source of supply. And when we really understand that, everything is going to change direction for us. Nothing can be made from something any more than something can be made from nothing. But where does water come from? Let's give it some thought. If we went outside on a nice clear day and stood there with a cup, just stood there, and we were patient, and we stayed there long enough, do you know that that cup would fill with water? Oh, yeah. You would see in the no thing, no thing you would see a cloud formation. And the cloud would become very heavy and very dark, and before long, water would fall out of it. Now, if we stayed there with that cup, where would the water go to? 
they go right back to where it came from. See, as above, so below. As below, so above. I want you to think about that. Nothing is created or destroyed. Everything's in a constant evolution of change. We literally live in a notion of motion. You and I have the godlike ability to create images in our mind. And as we create the images in our mind, we control the vibration that we're in, and that vibration sets up an attractive force. In the seminars that I conduct, I hold up a little acorn sometimes that comes from a giant oak tree. But the little acorn is nothing but a mass of energy in a high speed of vibration. It's just a little physical nut. Now, if I kept that acorn in my pocket, that acorn would disintegrate because it's governed by a very, very basic law, create or disintegrate. And it's not in an environment that's conducive to its unfoldment. But let's suppose I take and I plant that acorn in the earth. Do you know that there's particles of earth that are in harmonious vibration with that little mass of energy that we call an acorn? See, if you looked at the acorn through a microscope, it's not solid. It's just a little mass of energy that's dancing. Let me digress for a moment. Let's suppose I took two drops of water on a glass top table and I pushed them together until they touched. Then I'd have one drop, wouldn't I? I'd have a bigger drop. Let's suppose I put another drop and I pushed it together. Now, what do you think the odds are of me separating that one little drop, the one little puddle, I guess I could say, back into the same three little mass of molecules, the same three dots. You know it's not going to happen. You know, what God hath joined together gives it new meaning, doesn't it? Well, you see, there's particles of energy that's jammed right up against the acorn in the earth that don't vibrate in harmony with the acorn. But there's particles of energy that do vibrate in harmony with the acorn, and the acorn's like a magnetic force, and if you could see it with the naked eye, you would see little particles of energy marching just like obedient soldiers right towards the acorn. And as they touch the acorn like that, like the two drops of water, they become one with the acorn. And this process is continuous. It's continuous. And the only particles of energy that the acorn can attract are the particles that vibrate in harmony with it. They're on a frequency. And the acorn keeps attracting and keeps expanding. And the shoots come out of the bottom, and it breaks through the earth, and it attracts from the atmosphere as well as from the earth. And before long, you'll see a giant oak tree all by attraction. It's all energy moving. There's one source of supply, just one. Well, do you know that you are attracting to you right now from an infinite source? Now, if you're holding thoughts of lack and limitation, that's what you're going to attract. The universe, by law, can only give you what you put in the order for. What are you putting in the order for? We talked in a previous Video about thinking. There's a law of thinking. Well, as you think, you attract. So think about it. What have you put in an order for? What are you attracting? Everything comes from one infinite source. You might say, well, I don't really understand that. Then just take my word for it, because I do understand it. And if you study it for a while, you're going to start to understand it. Like Solomon said, in all you're getting, get understanding. Well, let's understand where everything does come from. There's no lack. There's no limitation. As long as you live through your sensory factors and just go by what you see, then there will be lack and limitation because you're dealing with a very limited view. But when you start dealing with God's eye view, you see things from a much higher level. There's no lack and no limitation. And understand this. What you think, you attract. And you attract from one infinite source of supply. Study this law of supply. It's a phenomenal law. And it works for every person, every time, everywhere. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you. Hello there and welcome. I'm Bob Proctor, and I am attracting good, great, and wonderful things into my life. Money comes to me in increasing quantities through multiple sources on a continuous basis through the law of attraction. And that's what I want to talk to you about, the law of attraction. See, the underlying law that regulates supply in the world of effects has two important phases. One is desire, and the other is expectation. I want you to imagine that you're fishing. Now, you may have never gone fishing. You've certainly seen people that have gone fishing. And you take and you get the line all fixed, and boom, you cast it out. And as soon as that plug hits the water, bang, a fish strikes. Now, you got the fish on the end of the line, but 
you are never going to have that fish if you don't reel it in. Well, you see, when we desire something, we are instantly connected with the invisible side of whatever good we desire. It's expectation that reels it in. Now, most people don't understand this, and they attract what they don't want rather than what they do want. I remember years and years ago, I got a bumper sticker that said, expect a miracle. And, and I kept looking at that bumper sticker, and I kept looking at it and looking at it, and I got to the point where I was expecting something so good to happen in my life that I wouldn't be able to explain it. You see, I come to realize that a miracle is a word, Voltaire said, it's a word that we invented to express the known effects of unknown causes. It's something that's so good that's happened to us that we're at a loss to explain how it happened. I want to explain how I attracted something into my life that literally changed my life, changed my business, but it changed the lives of two or three hundred million people as well. I got a phone call on my cell phone, and it was a very garbled message. I had difficulty understanding it, and I didn't delete it, but I just kept hitting the pound or the hash and leaving it there in the phone. And one day, my phone was full. So I thought, well, I should empty the thing. I think I was in an airport at the time, so I sat down and I took all the messages off one at a time and wrote them all out and then deleted them. And I phoned Gina Hayden, who's worked with me for the past quarter century, and I said, Gina, Gina, I think this woman's name is Glenda, and I think this is the phone number. It sounds like an Australian phone number. Would you phone another, something about a film? Would you phone and see if, if, it's, if it, the number is even the right number? Now, I'd had it on my phone for a good month. And so at any rate, a couple of days later, or maybe even later that day, I forgot now, um, I'm talking to Jean, and she said, well, that was the right message. Her name was Glenda, and um, you had the right phone number, and there's a film crew in from Australia, and they're shooting this film, and they really wanted you in it. But they haven't been able to reach you, and um, they're shooting in Aspen all weekend, and they're going back to Australia first of the week. And Gina said, isn't that strange? Bob's doing a seminar this week in Aspen. Now, I hadn't been in Aspen for a couple of years. And I check into my hotel. I just went next door where they were shooting the film. And the film, of course, was the secret. And you know, all of a sudden, all over the world now, people know Bob Proctor, and they know about the work that I did, that I love doing. I believe that I attracted Ron Byrne into my life. But I also believe Ron Byrne attracted me into her life. And you see, the secret I attracted, I expected something big to happen. And I'm going to tell you something, I expect something even bigger to happen. Now, the law of attraction is, um, it's a law that many people now are very familiar with. And of course, I I, I think that the, uh, the secret has probably communicated that law better than anything that, that I have come across in all the years I've been in this business. They deserve, the people that put that all together, um, deserve a lot of credit. They, a lot of people think I made it. I didn't make the film. I just sat there for a couple hours and talked, sharing what I knew. And uh, a lot of good things have happened. Now, the law of attraction is not a primary law. The law of vibration is the primary law. See, everything in the universe vibrates. We literally live in a notion of motion. I want you to look at the walls that surround you. You think those walls are solid. They're not solid. Nothing is resting. Everything is moving. A body and a coffin is moving. Now, you may think that I'm sniffing something, but I'm really not. If you go into a, into a funeral home and pick up the remains and look at it through a microscope, you will see particles of energy dancing right before your eyes. Now, if it wasn't moving, how would it ever change to dust? Well, you see, you and I have a brain. And our brain is an electronic switching station. And our thoughts activate brain cells and control the vibration we're in. And the vibration we're in controls what we attract into our life. Now, this law of attraction is a phenomenal law. And, and I think the law of attraction, as it's brought out in this series, 
is an, it's very well done. And I would encourage you to study into it in some depth. Because everything that comes into your life, you attract into your life. Now, you may be saying, does that mean that I have a cold, that I sat and thought I'm going to get a cold? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But you did attract the cold. You see, I don't think you, you sit and think I'm going to attract a cold. I think you put yourself in a very confused vibration. There's a law of gender. It decrees that all seeds have a gestation during an incubation period. And after about 30, 45 days of going through that indecision, that confused state, you, you have a cold. That's what the cold is. It's just the expression of all the confusion. Anyway, we do attract everything into our life. Now, for many, many years, I, um, I had a terrible time with money as most people do. And I was forever letting my outside world control my thinking. So my outside world was dictating what I was going to attract. Now, I didn't have any money. I had debt, and I'm thinking debt. I attract debt. If your goal is to get out of debt, you're going to stay in debt forever. Because whatever you think of, you attract. You'll say, but I was thinking of getting out of debt. I don't care if it's get out or get in. You've got to start seeing what you want. In a previous lesson, we pointed out that, um, that you don't work on cold if you're cold. You work on heat. See, cold is the absence of heat. So you work at creating heat. Well, if you want good in your life, quit trying to change the bad. Quit trying to get rid of the bad. Let it go. Let the dead bury the dead. Let it be part of the past. Start to see the good that you desire. Visualize it. See it as present in your mind. The second you've got the idea in your mind, you've got it intellectually. The second you internalize it, you've got it emotionally. And then it's only a period of time until you attract it physically. Attraction's a very powerful process. We are all magnetic creatures. We're all a mass of energy. Everything in this universe works on the law of attraction. You go into uh, some restaurants, and they're always busy. The energy is good in those restaurants. You go into others, there's hardly anybody there. Isn't that strange? You go into a clothes store, and you, you may be the only person there outside of the person that's running it. You go into others, and there's people coming and they're going all the time. It has to do with the energy of the place of business. And the place of business is nothing but an expression of the consciousness of the person that's running the business. When we start to understand this, when we start to understand that we literally attract everything into our life, and it's our thoughts that are controlling what we attract, our whole world's going to change. You see, nature does not just deprive us of any good or desired thing. Now, Hollywell points this out so well. It does provide us with the mental equipment and the inner power to acquire and enjoy the essential good to ensure a happy and a worthwhile existence. And it all happens in a very simple method. It's, it's so complicated because nobody studies it. See, I always feel if we can teach a little child that maybe is just learning to walk, how to talk. We can teach them language. We can teach them multiple languages. A baby at birth is a linguistic genius. If we can teach the child language, surely we can teach them something so basic as these laws. You say, well, why haven't we? Because hardly anybody understood them. The parent's not going to teach them something to the child that they don't even know. The parent's only going to give the child what they've got. You see, what you don't fix your kids are going to inherit. You should put a big sign on the refrigerator, attraction. Put it on the outside of your bank account. Hang it in your mirror where you put your makeup or shave in the morning. Put the word attraction everywhere. And start to realize whatever you want, you'll begin to attract. That is an absolute law. This isn't just my idea. It is an idea that I've fallen in love with. And I want to recommend you fall in love with it. Study these laws every day. Now keep in mind, this video series is just an overview of these laws. Get into it in depth. Get the script. Study the script. You'd be so glad you did. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you.
For many years now, in seminars that I've been conducting or conferences where I'm speaking, I mentioned to the audience a personal growth program might be if it does not have a spiritual foundation, in my opinion, it's incomplete. This program definitely has a spiritual foundation. I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you on the law of receiving. Here's a line from it. He who seeks a greater life with getting as his objective does not seek life in trueness of spirit. In other words, they're going to have a problem. They are definitely going to have a problem. Now let me read another highlight from this program, and that's exactly what this video series is. It's it's a series of highlights that I've gleaned from this over many years of studying it. In a state of limited understanding, we reason that we must get before we can give. And then we turn and walk in the same mental rut as before by reasoning that we must give before we can get. But in our lack of understanding, we continue to leave the getting idea foremost in our thought, and we shut out the spirit of giving. Now, giving, which is the first fundamental law of life, is the first law of all creation. The attitude of getting is the law of life in a congested state. Now, I'm going to repeat that. The attitude of giving is the law of life in a congested state or a repressed action. As long as getting dominates a mind, that mind is in a paralyzed condition, being limited in its action in accordance with the fundamental law of creation. Many years ago, I had a, um, a wonderful mentor who's gone now, and I, I really miss him, Leland Bell Van de Waal. He was a big man in stature, but in understanding. And he taught me something very valuable very early in my career in this business. He said, Bob, you must willingly give and graciously receive. He said, you have to understand that this entire universe is based on a law of circulation. You've got to keep the energy circulating. You're merely a terminal through which it flows. You see, I have since come to the understanding that you and I are here to do God's work. Now, God being the creator, work is creation. God's work is creation. And so you and I are given creative faculties. And through the proper use of these creative faculties, everything starts to happen in a very good way for us. We have to understand the laws. Well, we have to understand that receiving is a law. Now, before you can receive, you have to create a space for it. In the last chapter in the uh, Born Rich book, the program that I did a number of years ago, I talked about the vacuum law of prosperity. You must create a space for the good that you desire. Now, to create a space for the good that you desire, you must give something. You have to let go of something before you can receive something. As you activate ideas in your mind and send off a charge of energy, your brain will take on an equal amount of energy of a like nature. If you send out a negative thought, your brain is going to take on an equal amount of negative energy. However, if you send out a positive energy, your brain is going to take on an equal amount of positive energy. This is so basic, and yet it's so misunderstood. You see... We've got to be relaxed if we're going to have this happen. You've got to put yourself in a totally relaxed state. And and you have to operate with understanding. Now, I'm not suggesting this is going to happen just because you're watching this video. But it will happen if you continue to watch it over and over and over again. Something's going to click inside. I have found through repetition, our perception of life changes and changes dramatically. See, perception is one of our intellectual factors. It enables us to see life in many different ways. As we increase our awareness, our perception of life changes. Well, we've got to realize that everything we're seeking is seeking us. We've got to be open to the good that we're looking for in life. We've got to understand that the only way to receive good is to give good. We've got to put it out and we take it on. If I cause someone I come in contact with to feel good about themselves, 
I am going to feel good because I put that good through me to get to them. So do you see, I receive simultaneous with giving. They're all hooked together. You can't separate them. It's the flip side of the coin. But before we can receive, we've got to give. Now, you know, it's like we say, how can I give if I haven't got it? But you have got it. You have got it. You give what you have got. You see, I think you should give your time, your energy, your loyalty, your knowledge, your money. Keep giving it, and you're going to keep getting more. When we open ourselves up to receive, we're going to find that we are in a relaxed state. Let me read you something that Hollywell pointed out. When we relax from strain, the law has a chance to reply to our desires. And things begin to change for us. Have you not seen this work in trivial things such as books or clothing or invitations or a desire to see a certain friend? Possibly at some time you sent out a thought or a desire and then forgot about it. Just totally forgot about it. The next thing you knew, you had the book presented to you. You received an invitation. You were walking down the street and bumped into the friend that you desired to meet. It happens all the time. But you see, if we're focused on it and we're straining and we're really, you know, trying everything we've got, we're uptight. It doesn't happen. My wife and business partner, Jerry Robert, and I were sitting in a restaurant the other night. And it was rather interesting. We had just sat down. And this woman came over and she was bubbling over. She says, I can't believe it, you. I just can't believe. I, I said, said to my partner, did you see who just walked in here? And, and she said, I just can't believe it, you. And then she pulled the secret out of her purse. And then, in a very excited fashion, she waved to her partner to come up. He was the chairman and CEO of a company. She was the president and chief operating officer of the company. The company is World Moon Resorts. Their brand is the moon. How would you like to have that for a brand? Everybody on earth can look up and see their brand. Doesn't matter where they are. Well... She started to tell us a story, how they were working on this project. They'd been working on it for about 10 years. That they'd been working on this project, and they had spent millions of dollars and all of their time, and they were almost ready to give up. And I guess when they're almost ready to give up, they just sort of relaxed. And someone gave them the secret, and the secret fired them up again. Now, we were listening to them. We weren't quite sure what they were talking about, moon resorts and and they were going to build this place in Abu Dhabi, over in the UAE, and, and, uh, and it was going to be the largest, the largest project in the world. 60,000 condos. And we're looking at them and listening. We're thinking, wow, you know, this is really getting pretty interesting. Then they gave me their two business cards. And they said, here's your ticket to the moon. Now... He went out to the car and come back in and gave us a DVD. I got home and I watched the DVD. Well, it almost blew my mind. It was absolutely incredible. I want you to go to their website and take a look at it. It's just www.worldmoonresorts, worldmoonresorts.com. It's phenomenal. And, you know, these two people were so excited by what they received, but they had... Giving, giving, giving. They've been putting out for years. And somebody walked up and handed this to them. And I thought, well, if they're that excited over the secret, I'm going to excite them some more. So when I got home, I, uh, I uh, sent them a Science of Getting Rich program, big box in a briefcase, and, and uh, they got it the next day. Tonight, Jerry and uh, my business partner, my wife and I, and Sandy, another business partner of mine, we're going to have dinner with them. They're leaving for Abu Dhabi tomorrow. But they're fascinating people. They're operating with a huge idea. These people are really into understanding this. And they're putting out and they're receiving. But you've got to understand, it's the thought that you give it with that makes the difference. Do you know there's an interesting story that Billy Graham tells about one time, this is when they were struggling. This is when Billy Graham was really just starting out. And $100 probably would have rented a real nice place for a month and bought the food that you needed. But at any rate, the collection plate come around 
and he put a $100 bill in. And later on, he says to his wife, my goodness, I thought I put $20 in. I put 100 And she looked at him, and she said, isn't that too bad? You're only going to get the good back for putting 20 out. I thought, what a great story. And that's exactly the way it is. You'll say, but he gave 100 wouldn't you? No, no. The thought that he gave it with, he was giving 20 You see, it's thinking that controls everything. It's the thought we give it with. In the science of getting rich, we talk about leaving everyone with the impression of increase. Why? Because by giving out good, we're going to receive. See, the giving and the receiving are all tied together. They're not separate. You've got to be open to receive, but you'll be open to receive when you really understand the concept of giving. This is an order of the universe, and energy is forever moving. You have to understand that your life is full right now. Now, it may not be full of what you want, but your life is full. Your calendar is full. All your time is spoken for. You'll say, well, it's really not. I've got a lot of wasted time. That's how you're using it then. We must replace the waste with productivity. Yet, and for everything in your life you don't want, it's part of what your life's full of. What you've got in your life is a reflection of what you've been giving. And if you want greater good, you've got to give greater good. The more good we put out, the more we're going to take on. We don't have to worry about what we're going to receive. Let's understand the receiving is governed by law. And the basic law behind it is in giving. And as you give, you receive. You see, if you're sitting in a chair right now, you can't... You couldn't put anything where that chair is until you get rid of the chair. This is why the vacuum law of prosperity is such a beautiful concept. Nature truly abhors a vacuum. You give, and you give in abundance, pressed down and running over. And I guarantee you, you'll never have to worry about what you're going to receive. But like my old mentor said, we've got to willingly give and graciously receive. And you see, willingly giving, that's the expression of a lot of faith. But it isn't blind faith. It's faith based on understanding of these laws. So as you dig into this law of receiving, start to think of who you can give to, what you can give, where you can give, and then give everywhere you go. Give the very best you've got. And you know something? You'll receive the very best the universe has. It's sitting there waiting for you. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you. Hello there, and welcome. I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you about the law of increase. You see, I'm betting that you would like everything in your life to increase. I bet you want more love. I bet you want better health, more energy, more money, more business. And that's very natural. You should want it. But you've got to understand, you can have it. That's the beautiful truth. There is an infinite source of supply. I love the way Thomas Troward put it. When you're dealing with infinite, you can never take more than your share. You see, if we had a pie, and we'd cut the pie maybe in six pieces, we can all relate back to this when we're kids. If you wanted a bigger piece of pie, someone had to get a smaller piece of pie. But we're not dealing with a pie. We're dealing with creation. And we can make a bigger pie, and then everyone can have a bigger piece. Increase in life is based upon laws. Do you know there's a, a marvelous series of programs that you probably have, and you probably love, the science of getting rich. In fact, it was the science of getting rich that the secret was based on. It was the science of getting rich that Rhonda Byrne read, her daughter gave it to her, and everything started to happen in her head. Well, Lloyd Conant gave me the science of getting rich in 1968. It wasn't long after that, and I come across Raymond Hollyoll's work on the law. I was looking for a book or a program that explained the law in practical, everyday person's thinking way of life. And I was having difficulty finding it. I had books on the law, but most of them were so heavy, the average person would have just died trying to understand them. 
And I got picked up at O'Hare Airport in Chicago one day by a lady that was taking me to the hotel to do a seminar. And she had a bench seat in the front of her car. And beside her was a big brown paper shopping bag. And when I get in the car, she says, you want to look in that bag? I found a new bookstore. And I put my hand in and I pulled out this green book, Working with the Law, by Raymond Hollywell. And I looked at her and I said, you've got one less book. I'm taking this book with me. I have attracted this book. I have been looking for this book for a long time. Now, in that book, Hollywell talks about all this information that we're sharing with you. Mary Morrissey and I have uh, studied the same material for a long time. And we've created this program that you're involved in right now. And you see, this series of videotapes is really just an overview of these laws. And the law of increase is one that you really want to understand. If you're going to increase anything in your life, you have to raise it. Now, you may say, well, how do you do that? Well, in the Science of Getting Rich, the seventh chapter is on gratitude. And the more grateful you are, the more you're going to receive. But you've really got to be grateful. Now, praising and gratitude are very much along the same line. See, we want to praise our source of supply. We want to praise spirit. We want to praise abundance. And it's going to come into our life. Now, let me share something right out of the book. Listen very carefully to this. Have you ever had someone condemn or criticize your efforts when you were given the best you thought you had and really tried to please them? I'm sure you have. I know I have, and I'm sure you have. Didn't you feel like folding up and just quitting? Just say, it's over. Perhaps even felt like quitting the job and letting someone else worry about it. Well, least of all, such an experience suppressed your interest, your zeal. You see? And you did not desire to do better. Now, Hollywood is mentioning this. That's how one reacts when the law is reversed. Whereas when someone praises you for efforts, you feel like expanding and doing better, trying harder to be more perfect. Your interest becomes greater because of that pleasure. And within your happiness, you bring happiness into your work and all around you. It is a well-known fact that every plant is responsive to praise, for I have even seen flowers praise to longer life and beauty. We say a person that praises the plants has a green thumb. You say that person just has a green thumb. They've got such beautiful gardens, but they love their gardens. They love them. They send nothing but loving energy to the plants. Well, when you send loving energy to your source of supply, you're going to find that increase is just automatically going to happen. You're just going to get more. Do you know, I have read time and time again, and I experienced this myself, so I know it to be true, that people that are very successful in something have a very difficult time differentiating between work and pleasure. And that is because they love what they're doing. They're forever, they're forever grateful for being able to do what they're doing. They do praise it. And the more you praise what you're doing or the people that's working with you, the more you're going to win. It's been proven that a failing business can be praised into success. Suppose lost friends have returned their affections when the law of praise was used. Think about this. When you put good into anything, good's going to come back. We started this whole series out with thinking. We pointed out that every great leader that has ever lived has been in complete unanimous agreement that we become what we think about. Well, if you think bad thoughts and if you're looking at things and you're looking at the downside and you're condemning and criticizing everyone, what kind of a vibration are you in? But if you're looking at what they do good, you're looking for the good in everything and you're praising them, what happens? Do you know that a child that is raised with criticism grows up a very insecure human being? It's true. This is a known fact. The child that's raised with praise grows up very confident. The child that's raised with criticism usually struggles throughout their life. The child that's raised with praise goes on to become a great leader and very confident. 
This is so obvious. It's true in plant life. It's true with money. It's true with your friends. Praise your friends. Praise what they're doing. I guarantee you they're going to think better thoughts of you. They're going to be looking for what they can do for you. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Praise changes our observation, our whole outlook of life. In the past, we were in the habit of seeking um, our weaknesses and failings, as well as the shortcomings of others. But now we see differently. You see, praise changes your perception. Now think of this for a moment. If you're going to praise people for what they're doing, you're first going to have to look for something they're doing good. And if you're looking for something to, you're, they're doing good, what you're doing is you're using one of your higher faculties, one of your creative faculties called perception. You're looking for it. You're seeing the good in it. And then when you see it, you want to make them aware that you see it. Well, this doesn't just work with people. This works with plants. It works with animals. It works with all of life. Because we've got to realize that intelligence is omnipresent. Intelligence, there's intelligence in a garden rock. There's just no conscious awareness of the intelligence. See, intelligence is omnipresent. We're talking about a power that's 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. Yet this power operates in a very exact way. It's by law. So it only makes sense that if praise works with people, it works with plants, works with animals, it works with all of life. And if we're going to praise anything, we're going to have to see the good in it. We want to look for the good, and then we want to praise it. Now, if I were looking for the bad, you're not going to praise bad. You're going to criticize it. You're going to condemn it. You're going to feel bad. You're going to feel sorry for yourself. But if you're using your perception to find the good in life, then it's going to become easy to praise it. Be grateful for it. See, praise is a, it's a great concept. And you want to know something? It is the basic foundation governing the law of increase. If you want to increase anything in your life, begin to praise it. Be grateful for whatever you've got and see greater good coming. Now remember, we talked about receiving. You've got to be open for it. You've got to be relaxed. Well, if you want to receive increase, you've got to be open, you've got to be relaxed, and you've got to praise what you've got. I know that you're enjoying this series. I know you are, because I'm enjoying doing it. I'm enjoying sharing this. Now, if I am enjoying sharing this with you, I know that you're enjoying receiving it. What I want to suggest is you do what I'm doing. It works. It's helped me earn millions of dollars. It's helped me build an enormous abundance of friends all over the world. It's helped me build a business right around the world. So I want you to do what I'm doing. I am enjoying sharing this, and I'm praising you for using it, you go and extend it. Let's keep this energy flowing. To me, through me, to you, through you. Who are you going to give it to? You know it works. You want to increase? Praise what you've got and share it. Willingly give it and graciously receive it. The law of increase is based on a fundamental principle, praise. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. You know, it's written in the good book that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, you know, Emerson said that was the law of laws. And he said, if that law didn't exist, we should invent it. I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you about the law of compensation. I first learned the law of compensation from Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale explained it probably better than anywhere I've ever read it. Now, I've read Emerson's essay on compensation, and we, of course, have the Law of Compensation here in this Working with the Law series. But the Law of Compensation is a law that we must understand. And we must understand it if we're going to apply it. And when we do apply it, we're going to find that the universe is very friendly towards us. The Law of Compensation is based on three steps. The amount of money or good you receive is going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there is in replacing you. I want you to think about that for a moment. The amount of money or the good you receive in life is going to be based on just three points. The need for what you do, your ability to do it, 
and the difficulty there will be in replacing you. You see, I quickly learned that there is a phenomenal need for what we do in our business. People are confused. People do not understand the laws. People are are watching to what's going on in the world. We're dealing in a very fast-changing world. We're not dealing, the world's not getting bigger, the world's getting smaller. We're, We're dealing in a world market today. You're only just a touch of a button away from anywhere in the world. We can look and watch what's going on on the opposite side of the world on a television set that's strapped to our wrist the size of a watch. Hit a button today and we send a message to a million people all at once and they get it wherever they are with email. Think of how the world has changed. It's changing so dramatically. And you know what it's looking for? It's looking for effective people. That's right. Everybody wants someone to serve them. Now think, is there a need for what you do? I would suggest there probably is. There's probably a great need for what you do. And you didn't even have to do anything to create that need. It's there. The second step is your ability to fill that need. How good are you at doing what you do? That's so important we understand that. Most people just do enough to get by. It's been often said that most people work just diligently enough so they don't get fired, and the company pays them just enough so they won't quit. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's in violation of the law of compensation. See, the second step, your ability to do it, is going to take care of the third step if you do the second step right, the difficulty there is in replacing you. When you become so effective at what you do, You're very difficult to replace. That's when your stock goes up. You will find that there will be people waiting in the wings to hire you, to pay you to go and work for them. When you perform your task to the very best of your ability, or when you are through your work and you do it well, you infallibly bring out the best there is in you. And you see... I learned a long time ago that if I make up my mind, I'm going to learn how to communicate this more effectively all the time, then my income is going to keep going up. My customers are going to keep coming. Now, we have people come to us from all over the world. That is not an accident. That is by design, and it's by law. Now, you might ask where you live. I live in Toronto, in Canada. Now, my office is in Phoenix, but I have other offices around the world, and I work with people all over the world. But how did you and I come together? I'm going to suggest that you and I came together because I made a decision many years ago that I was never going to stop attempting to improve the service I render. And hopefully, I would attract people like you into my life because I was giving the very best I've got and always trying to do it better. See, every day I study. I study every day. Now, I've been doing this since 1961. Prior to 1961, I never studied. Never did anything. I just tried to get by. And, of course, I didn't do very well. I was earning just a little bit of money, and I was in debt over my head. And um, I had a difficult time finding work. Today, I don't have a difficult time finding work. I have a difficult time hiding from it from periodically. But we work all over the world. Why? Well, three steps to love compensation. The need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there is in replacing you. Now, if you make up your mind that, and understand that you have infinite potential, no one knows what you're capable of doing. The most erudite scientist alive will not even guess at what you're capable of doing. As far as energy is concerned, we've studied this many ways. You've got about 11 million kilowatt hours per pound potential energy locked up in the electrons in the atoms of your body. Your brain is an electronic switching station that boggles the mind of the wisest. Your central nervous system is the most phenomenal electrical system in the entire universe. It would make a supercomputer look like a toy. Do you know that the blood circulates through hundreds of miles of passageway every 33 seconds, just like that? It carries all the food in, all the garbage out in one sweeping change. Have you ever stopped and thought about the power that you represent? You've got all these mental faculties. You can tap into an infinite source of supply. Listen, 
When we talk about you, we're talking about something that is awesome, the highest form of creation on the planet. That's what you and I are. Now, are we using it? Well, for many years, I didn't. My whole idea was just get by. But then I started to study this material, and it started to make sense. And I thought, I'm going to change. I'm going to change how I'm living. And I got into Earl Nightingale's material. Now, I got into Napoleon Hill first, then into Earl Nightingale's. And I began to study it. And I got into this law of compensation. Then I read Emerson's essay on compensation. Then I got into um, Raymond Hollywell's material on compensation. It's all telling us the same thing. It's up to you. It's up to you. The universe will give you whatever you ask for. But you ask in the form of providing service. You see, you get back exactly what you put out. You put a lot out, you get a lot back. We are raised with the misconception that you go to work to earn money. You don't go to work to earn money. Working is the very worst way to earn money. We have a company called the Chairman's Club. And the Chairman's Club is designed for one thing, to show people how to earn money. You just go to uh, Life Success or LSChairmansClub.com, LifeSuccessChairmansClub.com, and look it up. That, that's the sole purpose of it. And in that club, we show people how to earn money, how to set up multiple sources of income. But the whole thing is based on providing service. You've got to provide service. See, the concept behind the club is that you can earn so much money when you're sleeping, you can do whatever you want when you're awake. Now, that sounds bizarre to most people, but most people don't understand the law of compensation. We're raised with the idea you go to work to earn money. You don't go to work to earn money. You go to work to gain satisfaction. You should spend your days doing what you absolutely love to do. But compensation, think about it. Our compensation comes to us by law. It's based on three factors. The need for what you do your ability to do it, and the difficulty there can be in replacing it. Now, I know you may have doubts. You may think, well, if I do more, I'm not necessarily going to get more. Well, you may not get it from where you're working. It may not come from there. It may come from somewhere else. You say, but the company makes up their mind how much I'm going to earn. No, they don't. You don't get your pay from the company. You get your pay through the company. Your pay comes from an infinite source of supply. You see, we've got a lot of these ideas wrong. And look at If you become bigger than your present position, by law, you must move ahead. That is an absolute law. That's that's the basic law of the universe. When something becomes bigger than the position that it's in, it moves on to the next space. And if your company is not going to give you more, there's going to be a dozen companies waiting in the wings for you to come along and help. The law of compensation is probably one of the most important laws. I would suggest that as you turn this set off, and you stop watching this particular video, ask yourself, how good am I at what I'm doing? Could I get better at it? Could I get a lot better at it? How can I get better at it? Understand this. You've got the potential. You've got more power than you than you will ever hope to utilize. Are you applying it? Who does a better job at what you do than you do? Are you studying those people? Study their lives. Find out what they do. Do what they do. Read the books they read. The more you study this material, the better you're going to get at what you do. But always remember, the law of compensation is based on three points. The need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there is in replacing you. And as you go through all the material in these laws, and you study the law of compensation, get the material, get the physical material and study it. It's all there. You're going to find that all the way through all this material, those three steps keep coming up. The law of compensation is based on what you do. Put the energy out there. Put the effort out. Get better at what you're doing. Say, I am going to get better every day at what I'm doing. And your whole world will improve. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. Do you know, the law of non-resistance is a law that 9 out of 10 people violate. And because they do, they cause themselves a lot of problems. It's a pretty well-balanced individual that understands how to live in harmony 
and not let this get to them. The law of non-resistance. Think of this for a moment. When you go to do anything that's out of the box, where you're really going where you've never been before, you're going to meet with resistance. As a matter of fact, if you don't meet with resistance, you're probably going in the wrong direction. You're not going ahead. You're either going sideways or backwards. Resistance is a signal that you're moving into a new area. However, whatever you resist persists. And what we're suggesting here is that you do not resist the resistance. Now, that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. But understand this. You and I are programmed to resist resistance. That's part of our animalistic nature, fight or flight. What we want to do is master this. And instead of fight or flight or react, let's respond. Do you know there's a, a beautiful concept? It's the law of psychological reciprocity that rests on this law. That law states, whenever you put good out, you'll get good back, but very rarely right away. When you put bad out, bang, you get it right back. Well, let's think about that for a moment. We'll use the martial arts as a metaphor here. Karate is a very hard form of martial arts. You whack me, I whack you. You kick me, I kick you. And we beat the daylights out of each other. That's resisting resistance. Karate is not the way we want to approach this. When somebody yells at us, let them yell. Let them vent all the negativity, but not hit back. Then you take judo. Judo is where you take the strength of the other person's shot and put them down. You don't win much doing that. It, you know, it's reported that um, Sir Winston Churchill was a master at psychological judo. One time, Bessie Braddock, who had been a member of Parliament for Liverpool, said, Sir Winston, you're drunk and disgusting. He said, yes, madam, I am. And he said, you're ignorant. You're ugly. But he said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be sober. <laughs> you say, what did he do? He won the battle and lose the war. Lady Astaire one time said to him, Sir Winston, if I was your wife, I'd put arsenic in your coffee. He said, madam, if I was your husband, I would drink it. Resisted. He loses. George Bernard Shaw apparently had sent Sir Winston a invitation to uh, Pygmalion when it came out in London that we probably know better as my fair lady today. And on the invitation, he put a written note, bring a friend if you have one. So Winston sent him a note back and saying that he was sorry he was tied up opening night, but he said, if the play's still running the second night, I'd be glad to come and see it. Now, you see, psychological judo, you put the person down with the strength of their shot. You win the battle, but you lose the war. Now, there's another way to do it, the non-resistant way. It's called a Kato. That's where you take a shot at me, I duck and let it keep on going. I take it and I duck and keep. You kick, I duck and keep on, let it keep on going. I do not let you touch me. I don't fight back. I stay fresh. And when you've vented all your negative energy, I'm as fresh as a daisy, and I can lead you to where you want to go. That's non-resistance. See, there's a law of non-resistance. Whatever you resist persists. So the next time you meet with resistance, rather than fight back, just let it go. It's not that important. And if you can get this law down pat, I guarantee you you're going to have a good trip all the way to the top. Because you see, It's whenever we get out of the box, when we're moving ahead. I'm working on a new project. In fact, I've been working on it for a year. I have met with enormous amount of resistance. I just let it go. I just let it go. And I know when there's a lot of resistance on a program that I'm involved in, I'm on the right track. You see, if you're just going sideways, there isn't any resistance. You're doing something you already know. The law of non-resistance, of these 11 laws that you're getting, this is one of the most important. Burn it into your mind. And remember, don't react, respond. I remember to close off with, I was doing a seminar with a, a bunch of teenagers in Hawaii one time. 
And I asked the kids, I said, what's the difference between reacting and responding? This one little 15-year-old girl looked off into space and she put her hand up. And she says, reacting is a habit. To respond, you have to think. It was the best answer I'd ever got. 15 years old. To react is a habit. To respond, you have to think. Now think of this. When you react, whatever it is that's causing you to react wins. You lose. When you respond, you win. The law of non-resistance. It's a great law to understand. Use it, and you'll win. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you. This is one law that I have really learned to love. Now I paid a big price before I learned it, but when I did learn it, my whole world changed. And you know, it wasn't until I had studied this material for some time that this law made sense. Let me read you something here that scientists have given to us. These are very bright people. You must understand that 90% of all the scientists that ever lived are alive today. Scientists accept the truth that the body of a human is moved by the mind, that all its functioning is governed by a ruling thought, whether that thought is subjective or objective, whether it's conscious or unconscious. Those who study the mental processes find that all the conditions of the body are created and caused by the mind. It is known that creation in and every form is governed by and subject to a law. Hence, when one misuses, inverts, or violates a law, this mistake is called a sin. This is interesting. A sin is a mistake a misunderstanding, and a misjudgment. A mistake is falling short of or disobeying the law, whether that law be mechanical or spiritual. Correction is the only method of adjustment or of appeasing the law. Thus, repentance and forgiveness are the only means available to alter and correct that mistake. I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you about the law of forgiveness. Now, for a long time, I never understood this. Sin is truly transgression of the law. Now, when I was a little boy, I was sent to Sunday school, like a lot of little boys that grew up in the part of the world where I grew up. And um, if I didn't go, my older sister would tell. And so I was punished when I didn't go. Now... I also learned that if I said this word or that word, it was a sin, and I was taught that the price of sin was death. Now, I thought that was rather severe, but that's what I grew up with. That was the idea that this little boy learned at a very early age. Now, I was a curious kid, and I was told if I said this or if I did that, it was a sin, and again, the price of sin was death. Well... I thought, I think I'm going to take a bite out of this apple. And I said it, and I didn't die. And I thought, aha, I think I'll try this. And I did it, and I didn't die. In fact, it was fun. So I thought, that mustn't be true. But you know, later on in life, as I started to learn the truth about how the universe operates, the laws, I found out it was true. It was my understanding or perception of what these people were telling me. And that was probably the problem. And it probably was even further than that. It's because of their intention of what they were saying, because I think I was getting what they were saying to me. Well, you see, there's a very basic law of life, and that law says create or disintegrate. We're going ahead or we're going back. Now, disintegrate doesn't mean that you're just going to disappear. You know, when we talk about live or die, that doesn't mean that our heart's going to stop and the blood stops flowing and we're either, you know, incinerated or placed in the ground. That doesn't have what that means. 
It means that we're either going ahead or we're going backwards. That means things are getting better or they're getting worse. If we violate the law, the price of sin is death. means things are going backwards. Things are not going to be as good as we want them to be. If we live in harmony with the law, we're going to go ahead. So do you see, sin is transgression of the law. Price of sin is you're going to go backwards. Live in harmony with the law, you're going to go ahead. Now, forgiveness is a phenomenal concept. I never used to think much of it. I thought, forgive, you know, what's it mean? It means let go of completely, abandon. Forgive yourself. You can't change what you did. Do you know there's many people wander around with great feelings of guilt? Guilt is a very, very, guilt and resentment are two of the most destructive emotions that you'll ever come up with. I was raised with guilt. Now, I've been telling people for years, if it gets to a point where you can't handle a problem that you've got, you should go to a professional. Well, it's like the guy said, I like a chef that'll eat his own cooking. I was raised with guilt, and so I experienced a lot of guilt, and I was having difficulty getting rid of it. And any little thing I did that, you know, uh, that I just didn't think was right, I would have great guilt over it. So I went to a psychiatrist in Southern California, in Century City. And I only went to that psychiatrist three or four or five times, I guess. And I was on my way down the last time that I went, and I realized I didn't have to go anymore. And uh, I phoned him, and I said that I wasn't coming. He said, well, come on down anyway, because I like what you're doing. I want to find out more about what you're doing. And he, um, he was able to help me get rid of the guilt. It was all a simple concept of forgiveness. Forgive means to let go of completely. Let it go. Forgiving is a very healthy concept. We've got to learn to forgive ourselves. We've got to forgive others. We have to realize that what we did yesterday, we cannot change. If you did something deliberately wrong, let it go. Forgive yourself. If you did it and you didn't do it deliberately, forgive anyway. Let it go. If someone else has done something to you, don't hold any resentment. Let it go. Now, that doesn't mean that you want to go and give them an opportunity to do it all over again. You may move away from that. But you cannot hold bad thoughts in your mind and move in a good direction. Listen to something else that Hollywell brought it out here. He said, a noted physician talking before a group of other medical people on this very subject of thought being the source of disease was recorded as having said in his concluding remarks, abnormal tumors and cancers are due to a long period of suppressed grief and anxiety. Another way of saying that such diseases are due to a lot of sinful thoughts getting bottled up and suppressed within our minds. If this state is so destroying, it might be wise for us to probe into our own selves and note the effect our emotions have upon the physical organism. Then let us seek, by every means at our command, to overcome and abandon and forsake every emotional tug that has a debilitating and disturbing effect. Do you know, that's such excellent advice. Do you know, if you go way back, you found out we're just absolutely ridiculous. A lot of bad blood comes from wrong thinking. Try and understand this. Everything works from a higher to a lower potential. When you're dealing with electricity, you must work from a higher to lower potential. We don't even know what electricity is, but we do know the laws by which it operates. If you want a greater flow of electricity, put in a bigger bulb, get a bigger transformer. The only limit placed on electricity is the limit that's placed on the form through which it's flowing. Well, it's exactly the same with us. We work from a higher to a lower potential. We go from the thought to the thing. Spirit always manifests through its polar opposite. You go from the non-physical to the physical. You and I have the ability to tap into a non-physical world, a world of thought. Yet we can choose our thoughts. We can choose any thoughts we want. Do you know Viktor Frankl was a Viennese psychiatrist, spent the war years in a uh, concentration camp. And he said it was while he was in the camp that he realized that regardless of the physical or intellectual abuse that he was subjected to, no one could cause him to think something he didn't want to think. Do you know that's where attitude begins? 
Attitude is the composite of our thoughts, which cause our feelings, which express in actions. See, our thoughts, feelings, and actions, when they're all in sync, that's an attitude. But we want to have the proper attitude, and we're going to live in a healthier body. We want to have the proper attitude, and we're going to enjoy the wealth that we look for. We want to enjoy the proper attitude, and we're going to have the friends that we want. But one basic concept is that you have to forgive yourself, and you have to forgive others. You see, guilt and resentment are without question two of the most destructive emotions that anybody can experience. Of all the laws that you're going to study, this could be one of the most liberating of all of them. Forgiveness. Letting go of. Abandon. Just let it go. And when it comes back into your mind, let it go again. Form the habit of not holding on to anything that's causing you to feel bad. Start to love yourself. Start to respect yourself. Have a healthy respect for what you're capable of doing. And understand this. Carrying bad thoughts about anyone or anything is not doing anyone any good. It's sinful. It's destructive. And the price of sin is death. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to bury you. But it may be burying your company. It may be burying your income. It may be burying your friends because they won't want to see you. Forgiveness, it's going to cause everything to grow. It's going to cause you to be healthier. It's going to cause your income to grow, your friends to grow, your business to grow. Forgive. It's a beautiful law. Forgive means to let go of completely, abandon, replace the thought with one of beauty, with one of plenty, with one of abundance. You'll be glad you did. I did it. I'm a happy, healthy, wealthy guy. And you know something? Lots of energy. It just flows freely to and through me. I forgave me and everyone else that occupied a bad place in my mind. You do the same. The law of forgiveness could be one of the greatest laws you study. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. Hello there, I'm Bob Proctor, and this could be one of the greatest misunderstood laws that there is. It's the law of sacrifice. Do you know, the way I was raised, and I would imagine probably the way you were raised, We were raised with the idea that sacrifice was letting go of something that we really valued. And it was was sort of losing, losing something that we valued. You know, there was some people that made great sacrifices, and they were considered very special. But the average person just never made those great sacrifices. Well, sacrifice is... It's a law that will bring nothing but good into your life. If we understand it, but we've got to understand it, and most people don't understand. Sacrifice is giving up something of a lower nature to receive something of a higher nature. I talked in one of the other laws about the last chapter in the Born Rich series, and it was on the vacuum law, vacuum law of prosperity. Well, sacrifice has to do with the vacuum law of prosperity. You move something out to make room for the good that you desire. Sacrifice is giving up something of a lower nature to receive something of a higher nature. And you have to give up the thing of a lower nature before you can receive the thing of a higher nature. So you see, sacrifice is based on a very good understanding of faith as well. Faith based on understanding. This is tricky. This isn't something that's just going to happen like that. Now I want you to think of this for a moment. I want you to imagine that you've gone to a great concert and you are marveled at the performance that you see. Or go to a great stage play and you see acting that is impeccable. Or watch a a, a great award-winning movie and you'll see acting and you'll think, wow. Or you may watch somebody like Tiger Woods. Watch the great athletes, some great soccer player, a great golfer, a great ball player. Watch the Olympics, and you see those swimmers or those athletes, and you think, wow, how does that happen? Well, it doesn't just happen. As this author said, granted, they may be exceptionally gifted, but those final magical results 
come not by chance or accident, but they come from discipline. Discipline that is consciously chosen, ardently desired, and patiently persisted in. Let me repeat that. Discipline that is consciously chosen, ardently desired, and patiently persisted in. I have often said that discipline is the ability to give ourselves a command and follow it. I will master this. I remember one time reading an article in an airline magazine, and um, Walter Cronkite was being interviewed. And uh, he was asked in the magazine, in the interview, um, how did these astronauts develop the courage to get into those space capsules? He said, it didn't take any courage for them to get into the space capsule. And as I read that, and I thought it's easy for him to say, he's sitting behind a microphone announcing it. He didn't get in the space capsule. But as I kept reading, I realized he was right. He said, What took the courage was the sacrifices they made, the study, the hundreds of hours of study, the repetition in the simulators. He said, that's what took the courage to prepare them to get in the capsule. It took discipline. It took discipline. How did Hollywell call it? He said, discipline that's consciously chosen ardently desired, and patiently persisted in. No one ever becomes great at anything by accident. We talk about people getting something for nothing. There is no such thing as something for nothing. That's absurd. When we're talking about the law of sacrifice, we're talking about letting go of something of a lower nature to receive something of a higher nature. In other words, it's saying, I'm going to give up the ice cream cone now to get the bicycle a little later. This is based on faith, and it's not blind faith, it's faith based on understanding. It's understanding that we have this infinite potential, we've got phenomenal potential, we can do better, I talked about it in the Law of Compensation, and we're going to get better, but only if we give up something that's valuable to us to receive something that's even more valuable. Think of the study, the practice. You know, I like watching two movies, Lawrence of Arabia and Patton. General Patton, great American general in World War II, who also thought that he was a general in Napoleon's army. Believed very much in reincarnation. And then Lawrence of Arabia, Watching Peter O'Toole, who literally mentally became Lawrence and Omar Sharif. You watch these actors. They're magnificent. You watch Lawrence come across the desert on that camel. Look at his face. They do a close-up on his face. He's not acting. He's living the part. Watch Patton. Watch the great speech right at the first of the movie. Get those two movies, buy them, watch them over. If you want to see people that made sacrifice, understood that law, and lived in harmony with the law to develop the greatness that they always had in them, you'll see it in those movies. Watch Patton. He's so good. You watch Omar Sharif. Wow. The acting is phenomenal. They understood this law of sacrifice. They gave up something of a lower nature to receive something of a higher nature. But they had to understand this concept of discipline. See, Hollywell said something always has to be sacrificed for something else. There's your law of compensation coming in here. You've got your vacuum law of prosperity coming in here. You've got to create the space for the good that you desire. Listen to what he says here. People everywhere are awakening to the necessity of disciplining their thoughts and acts. We train domestic animals carefully. We harness the forces of nature to serve us regularly and well. And yet when it comes to ourselves, the most valued of all, 
we let our thoughts run wild. No one can obtain their ambitions until they learn to discipline their mental force and are able to control their thinking. See, that's what this whole series is about. That's what all these laws are about. It's about working with the law. It's about bringing our mind into harmony with the law. It's about letting go of things of a lower nature so we can receive things of a higher nature. This doesn't happen by accident. The greatest marketers in the world, they spent years studying what they're doing. The greatest athletes, they spent years perfecting their skills. There's no free lunch. You're not going to get anything for nothing. You're going to have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to give up something of a lower nature to receive something of a higher nature. This whole universe operates by law. The law is something that happens every time for every person everywhere. Yet we've got to understand that sacrifice is a law. Get in harmony with it. Understand it. It's so priceless. Listen to this. Hollywell said, you cannot enjoy the satisfactions and pleasure of a true friendship and indulge in a bad temper. If you will not sacrifice your temper for friendships, you're going to sacrifice your friendships for a bad temper. Isn't that good? One cannot have a sterling character that friends will respect and trust and resort to crooked practices. If he will not give up his crooked ways of trustworthiness, he will have to sacrifice his trustworthiness for crookedness. You don't even have to think too deep on this to realize it's true. But I'll tell you something you will have to do. You'll have to work at it every day to make it a habitual part of your life. To make it a part of your paradigm. You see, most of the things we do are controlled by paradigms. Habits. Paradigm's nothing but a multitude of habits. And if we're going to change our life, we're going to have to change our paradigm. We're going to have to sacrifice the habit of a lower nature for one of a higher nature. So do you see, as you study into this, you're going to realize just how important discipline is. And I want to leave you with just an absolutely beautiful concept. You've got to discipline yourself. It's discipline that is consciously chosen. You've got to choose it. Someone else can't give it to you. This is done from within. It's discipline that's consciously chosen, ardently desired. You've got to really want it. Man, I so want to be better at what I'm doing. And patiently persisted in. Patient persistence. Seems like an oxymoron, isn't it? It's not. Patient persistence. Just steadily focus where you're going. You've got it. You've got all the talent and ability. You've got it inside. But if you're not prepared to sacrifice what you've got, you're never going to get anything better. And understand this. It's creator disintegrate. If it doesn't get better, it's going to get worse. You've got to discipline yourself. And you've got to live in harmony with this law of sacrifice. You'll be so glad you did. Working in harmony with the laws. <laughs> it's such a winning concept. I've proved it in my life. My friends all have in their life. That's why they're my friends. We work in harmony with the law. We're not perfect. We're working at it. Every day. I want you to work at it every day. This is Bob Proctor. There's a marvelous poem in this program, Working with the Law, by Henley. It's one I have loved for years, Invictus. Listen carefully, then read it over and listen to it over and over. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever the gods might be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. 
And yet this menace of the years finds me and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And you know, you can say that exactly the way Henley wrote it. By working in harmony with these laws, and especially the law of obedience. You know, a lot of people grow up and they don't want to be obedient. And and you're going to find some of the greatest leaders in the past. If you studied their lives according to society, they were definitely not very obedient. Many of them spent time in jail. They didn't follow the rules of the land always. But you know, they were obedient to the laws of nature or they would have never accomplished what they did. Hollywell said that you should be a builder and to him is given all the materials out of which to construct the kind of life you desire to live. You build in wisdom or in ignorance, according to your obedience, according to your understanding of a divine law and the use of it in your daily life. Now, you know, being obedient is not always an easy thing to do, but it's always rewarding. I'm not talking about you being subservient to some person that really doesn't understand what's going on in this universe. Let me go back and share with you again what I just read. He said here that you should be a builder, and you've been given all the materials out of which to construct the kind of life that you desire to live. Now, you're going to use these tools. You're going to build in wisdom or in ignorance, according to your obedience to, according to your understanding of divine law and the use of it in your daily life. If you don't understand the laws, you're never going to be obedient to them. You're going to violate them at every turn in the road. Why? Because we have been programmed to. We've been programmed to be good little go-getters, and yet the law says give and you'll receive. We've been programmed not to live in harmony with the law of sacrifice. No, no, don't let go of it. Keep what you've got and get more. (laughs) That violates the law. Listen to something else that he wrote here. The word obey means to submit to rule or to comply with orders or instructions. Obedience, then, is the governor of all movement, whether it be mechanical literal, or spiritual. A giant machine without its governor would tear itself apart, would be utterly destroyed because it failed to obey its own laws of momentum and gravity. An intellectual giant who fails to comply with the laws of learning will become as an idiot. A student failing to comply with or To obey the instructions of spirit, the law of God, will reverse the good and create evil. We are dependent entirely on obedience for our success or failure in this life. Now, business is founded on obedience, and as each member obeys the laws of commerce, they're going to succeed. You see, as we study these laws we have to understand that we've got to become obedient to them. Now, I don't know about you, but I spent, you know, years, as I think I've mentioned in this series, in the Navy. I wasn't particularly fond of being obedient to the orders that they dished out. First of all, some of the things they were telling me we had to do really didn't make a whole lot of sense, even to a thinking person. And I really didn't appreciate what they were making me do, and... When I wasn't obedient, I was punished. I paid fines and I did a lot of punishment on a parade square because I wasn't obedient. See, I am not obedient to a lot of the things that uh, society dictates because I think a lot of people are moving in the wrong direction. But as you start to study the law, you've got to bring discipline, as we just said in the last lesson, into your life. 
It's consciously chosen, you see, ardently desired, and then patiently persistent in. It's such a beautiful way you describe it. Well, we've got to bring discipline in our life, and we've got to become obedient to these laws. And if we don't become obedient to the laws, we're going to lose. It's just that simple. It's like you said about a machine that isn't obedient to the laws of momentum and gravity. It's going to fall apart. Well, I think it's becoming apparent as we get into this that this is not something for lightweights. This isn't something for just anybody up and down the street. Although it will work for everyone, not everyone's going to do it. Not everyone has brought discipline into their life. Not everyone follows all these answers. Now, listen to this for a moment. We see in nature the answer. She has no troubles she cannot overcome. She has no problems she cannot solve. She has no burden she cannot bear, no tasks she cannot perform. We're talking about nature. Why? All her operations are governed by the mighty law of harmony and order, which constantly removes every discord, which heals all diseases, which rights every wrong, which supplies every need. Now think. He went on to say, If in the winter a young sprout attempts to break through the soil before season, Mother Nature destroys that sprout, rills it off or freezes it out. Yet, at the same time, the very snow and ice that freeze the little unruly sprout serves as a blanket of warmth and protection to all other seedlings complying with her law. When man wishes to use nature in his work, such as farming or gardening, he must know how to comply with nature's laws. In turn, as he obeys her laws, he drives the best results, and in the end will enjoy the greatest harvest. And you only have to play with this for a little while, and you're going to realize just how accurate this is. He who obeys the laws of nature and acts as her obedient servant later becomes the master and reaps a full harvest. I know in my life, I don't do this perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm getting pretty good at it. And I'm a lot better at it than I used to be. And you see where it really starts, it starts with understanding these laws. Now, the more you listen to these videos, and keep in mind the videos are just really an overview. It's just a really give you a picture of where you're going with this. But as you dig into this in some depth, as, as, as you get into this, and then as you get into the other, the Science of Getting Rich series that we have, and I'm sure that you're aware of that, as you get into the laws there, we're getting into very basic laws that govern how everything happened. i got to go back and quote Rohner von Braun again. Here's a great rocket scientist. He said that these laws are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, sending people to the moon, and we can actually time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. Now think of this for a moment. I want you to think of your health. Think of your health for a moment. Just think the health of your body. Now I want you to think of your finances, the amount of money you earn. I want you to think of your friends, your social life. Think of your own family, your family. Think of every aspect of your life and understand this. Every aspect of it can be better if you live in harmony with the laws. Now, do you know, by doing this, you could be accused of being selfish. I like the way Oscar Wilde put it. He said, selfishness is not living as one wishes to live. Selfishness is asking others to live as one wishes to live. There's a lot of selfish parents. There's a lot of selfish people. They want people to live the way they want to live. You've got to be true to yourself. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. I've got to be obedient to these laws, and the more obedient I become, the more I'm going to win. But it's based on understanding, and understanding only comes one way. If there's another way that you know of, let me know, because I've been looking for a long time. 
You must understand these laws to live in harmony with them. Understanding only comes through study. Study these laws. Dig into this program. I guarantee you, you will be so happy that you do. And then share it with as many people as possible. You're going to love the next one. The law of success. It's a beauty. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. I sincerely hope that you get as much out of this law of success as I've got out of it over the years. When I came across this, I absolutely loved it. I have probably read this first page at least a thousand times. I've shared it with hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. And now I want to share it with you from how I see it. I'm Bob Proctor, and I want to talk to you about the laws of success as Raymond Hallowell shared it with me. He said, God intended every individual to succeed. Isn't that a nice idea? Every individual. That included me. That includes you. It's God's purpose that you should become great. Do you know, I remember reading a book a number of years ago by Robert Russell. And he said, there's no secret to becoming great. He said, you become great by doing little things in a great way every day. Isn't that good? Well, Hollywell's saying it's God's purpose that man should become great. It's God's will that man should not only use, but enjoy every good in the universe. The law of God denies us nothing. He says man is born to be rich. Well, you know, I created a program a few years back uh, based on everything I had learned up to that time, and it was called You Are Born Rich. It's, it's been considered one of the most complete programs on personal growth that you're ever going to find. If you go to bobproctor.com and take a look there, the Born Rich Learning System, because you were born rich. You have deep reservoirs of talent and ability within you. You're probably just a little short of money, but this program will show you how to do it. There's a company in Australia, New Ways, and uh, every one of their leaders give credit to the Born Rich Program for taking them right to the top of the company. Most of them have watched it over and over and over again. Well, man is born to be rich. He said, the powers inherent in you are inexhaustible. Now, think of that. The powers inherent in us are inexhaustible. This is a law. He said, each normal person is endowed with a complete set of faculties, which, if properly developed and scientifically applied, will ensure success ever-growing success. Do you know, Napoleon Hill uh, said that an educated person is not necessarily a person with an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. He said an educated person is a person who has so developed the faculties of their mind that they can acquire anything they want, or it's equivalent, without violating the rights of others. Do you know what the faculties of your mind are? Do you? If you don't, odds are pretty good you're not going to develop them. We're born and raised with sensory factors. We go by what we hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. And you know what that does? That programs us to live from the outside in. That programs us to live from the bottom up. You're letting the physical control the higher. Doesn't work that way. God works from the higher to the lower. Spirit always manifests through its polar opposite. The non-physical manifests through the, the physical. If you're going to do it in harmony with the law, that's the way you're going to have to work. You're going to have to work from the thought to the thing and not from the thing to the thought. You may be saying, well, what do you mean? Well, you don't let the bank account dictate your financial status. Don't do that. See, one of the things I ask people when they first come to work with me is what's the most they've ever earned in a year? I have a business partner, Jerry Robert, who runs the uh, Life Success Publishing, teaches people to write books. If you haven't got a book, you want to get in touch with it. Life Success Publishing, they're on the site. But at any rate, um, he shows you how books will change your life. Everybody's got a book in them. Well, he had written a book, and I asked him when I first met him. Mark Fair Hansen introduced me to him. And uh, I asked him, what's the most you've ever earned in a year? And he said, $100,000. He was pretty proud of it, and that was pretty good money 20 years ago. That's when I asked him. 
And I said, if you do exactly what I tell you, I'll show you how to change that into a monthly income. Do you know within months, he was earning that every month. The chairman's club that we have, um, you just go to bobproctor.com and you'll see the chairman's club advertise, we teach people to turn their annual income to a monthly income by setting up multiple sources of income. Now he says here, each normal person is endowed with a complete set of faculties which, if properly developed and scientifically applied, will ensure success, ever-growing success. Now, I'm going to tell you what they are. Um, I'm not going to go in any great depth on how to develop them. We do that at another time. You have perception. You, it's your way you look at life. You have your will. That teaches you to concentrate. You have your memory. There's no such thing as a bad memory. You have a perfect memory. Um, you have um, reason, okay? That's your thinking. And you have imagination. These are all phenomenal mental tools. And you can use them to develop greater and greater success. And you're going to have to use them if you're going to live from the inside out. Ever-growing success. He said, we're made for progress. Every person contains within themselves the capacity for endless development. Do you know, that excites me. I don't know about you. But I've been working on this now for 48 years. 48 years I've been studying this. And I know that I'm going to study for the next 48 years. I just want to keep getting better at it. Endless development. Advancement into all things is the law's great purpose. Now, that's a phenomenal idea. Advancement in all things is the law's great purpose. By learning to work with the law and promoting that aim, you're going to build yourself into a greater and a greater success. So you wonder, well, what is the win in me for really studying these laws? That's it. You're going to build yourself into a greater and a greater success. You're going to earn more money. You just keep earning more money. I went from earning $4,000 a year, now I earn millions of dollars. And it's easier. I don't work as hard. Napoleon Hill said, you know, it takes more, no more energy to work with a big idea than it does with a small one. Well, that's what we're saying here. You're going to have more friends, better friends. You're going to live in a healthier body. You're going to enjoy your work more. You're going to work all over the world. You're going to do what you want to do, live the way you want to live. By learning to work with the law and promoting that name, you're going to build yourself into a greater and greater success. Now listen to this. He said all of the processes of nature are successful. Nature knows no failures. That's huge. She never plans anything but success. She aims at results in every form and manner to succeed in the best. And fullest sense of the term, we must, you and I must, with nature as our model, copy her methods. In her principles and laws, we're going to discover all the secrets of success. I don't know about you, but that sort of excites me. I know one thing. The tide always goes out, the tide always comes in. The night always follows the day. Winter follows summer. This is the law at work. It's perfect in all of nature. And we can do the same thing. In her principles and laws, we're going to discover all the secrets of success. Now, he says, infinite resources are at our disposal. Infinite. There's no end to it. Infinite. There's no limit to our possibility. We can focus and individualize the elements, the forces, and the principles of the whole world. That's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Do you know that everything in this universe will rush to your aid when you're working in harmony with the law? This isn't some decision of some emotional or capricious God on a cloud. This is the absolute law of the universe. The law is the uniform and orderly method of the omnipotent God. It's the way everything works. Everything works perfect. Infinite resources. There's no limit to our possibility. We can focus and individualize the elements, the forces, the principles of the whole world. We can develop a wonderful intelligence. Thus, all of life's questions may be answered. All of nature's secret discovered. And all human problems solved. Nothing is impossible. Now, you may be thinking, well, the world is in dire need of this. Oh, you're so right. Absolutely. But do you know it's because we're living in harmony with the law that we can live the way we do? Do you know there's some people that have never seen a toilet? Do you know that there's some people that have never seen an electric stove or a watch? Do you know that the whole world lived like that not long ago? Do you know that the electric light is a brand new idea relative to most of the population of the world? 
Do you know that these things, everything we've got that we take for granted, they're relatively new. It's all happened just in the last century or so. Think of that. Think of it. This has happened because we start to understand the law. Think of what you can do. Higher faculties, remarkable talent, superior insight, and greater power are dormant at all. And by psychological methods, these exceptional elements can be developed to an extraordinary degree for actual and practical use. That's by you and me. Now, I have been working at this for a long time. I know this to be true. Every mind can develop greatness. There are no exceptions. Simply a matter of knowing how. True self-help, self-discovery, self-knowledge, and proper instructions of applying one's principles and using one's faculties, using one's forces, it'll advance any person. See, the mind is perfect. It's perfect. And man is mind. And we can think. And our thoughts turn into things. Practice will ensure efficiency. Use is going to bring forth results. Success, therefore, is within the reach of every aspiring person. Now, he asked a question. He said, do you wish to succeed? God, I remember reading this. First time I read it. Well, he said, you can. You possess all of the essentials within yourself. All you need is to gain a right understanding of the principles and the laws upon which success is based, and then apply the right methods of operating these causes until success is earned. But you must earn it. There is no free lunch. Now, I have just touched on the first page of the law of success. As you get into this, you're going to realize that there's great help everywhere around us. We can have everything we want. We can enjoy all the good we want to enjoy, but only if we work in harmony with the law. And the odds of us working in harmony with them is pretty slim if we don't understand them. We've got to study them. Now, what I have done here in this series is give you an overview. I hope I have inspired you to want to learn more. That was really my purpose in doing this. I was asked by the people who are promoting this series with us if I would give you a brief overview on film, and that's what I've done. And hopefully this will do what they hoped it would do, make you want to study into this in greater depth and share it with other people. You see, locked up in this program is a system for you to earn all kinds of money, have all kinds of fun, and enjoy greater good in your life. That's what I've been enjoying, and that's the purpose of my life, to help people like yourself do just that. I want to suggest that you go out and do the same thing. This is Bob Proctor, and thank you.